Hello, everyone. Really pleased to be here. Thank you for having me and all of us, really. Um, how about saving the world? Who here wants to save the world? Yeah, 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 it's dark, but I see some hands. That's great. Okay, we're talking about integration. I'm going to help you how to, sa to save the world. The issue, though, is you need a purpose. To save the world, you need a purpose. Saving the world is a really crap purpose. Not doing evil isn't even worse. Now you're not even trying to do good anymore. You're just, you know. Uh, you need a good purpose. So what's a good purpose? A good purpose is specific. Because a specific purpose might even be so specific that it's measurable. And if it's measurable, then it's accountable. And then you become accountable for what you're trying to do. Measurable is also good because you can sell measurable. People like to see and but like to pay for what they can put their hands on, what they can see works. Integration is interesting. We'll get back to that. We're going to hack some integration today and get a lot more specific on integration in particular. But I need to tell you some other things first. I'm a social venture capitalist. That sounds charming, doesn't it? It's like evil and good in some, some horrifying combination. Uh, I invest people's money in organizations and entrepreneurs that try to do good in the world. It sounds like a pretty good job, right? That's nice. Ten years ago, there wasn't a lot of jobs in social integration, I can tell you. Uh, there really wasn't. Uh, so I did other things in the meantime. I went and worked with diplomacy in the Middle East. I worked with microfinance and nonprofits in Africa. And I worked for evil investment banking in London. Yay. <laughs> then a billionaire gave me 5 million euros to do good in the world. That's a nice job. Or is it? We spent the first two years screening 400 applications from wanting to be do-gooders who were doing really interesting things around the world. And we said no to almost all of them. Can you imagine having a job where every day you get a call from someone who wants to do good and you are literally perfecting the process of telling them that their idea is not good enough or they haven't gone too far with it? That is the crappiest job in the world. <laughs> uh, at least it feels like it for a while. So let's talk about Glenn. Glenn is an entrepreneur that supposedly might have applied to our program. Glenn works with um, labor market integration of migrants. He helps migrants get into the labor market. Now, Glenn, he gets paid by sponsorship by big organizations. Sounds pretty good, right? Then has a good thing going on. There's two problems to that. What's Glenn really being paid for? Is Glenn being paid for helping migrants? Or is Glenn being paid for creating nice events where their sponsors are shown uh, in a very nice context? If Glenn is not being paid for the actual value that he wants to create, what's his incentive to keep creating and figuring out how to provide that value? That's a bit of an issue. Also, if I asked Glenn, and I've met a lot of Glens, you have a good thing going on. It seems like, you know, the model seems to be doing pretty well. Uh, you could go really interesting places with this. So what do you feel about the future? How do you feel about bringing this to the next level? Uh, Glenn starts squirming a little bit. And he starts saying that, uh, I don't want to grow too fast. It feels scary. You know, I don't want to, you know, I feel like I have a good thing going on with my target group here. I don't want to lose the connection I have here. I, I, I feel like, you know, I don't want to lose the quality in the work that we're doing. Okay. Okay. I can respect that. Glenn is a fire starter, a passionate idealist. Now, you all have a dilemma. If you want to save the world, you need that purpose. That's one thing. We're going to get deeper on that as well. But you need to choose. Are you going to be a fire starter or are you going to be an entrepreneur? Why do you have to choose between those two, you might say, right? Can't I just be both? Well, you might. That's entirely possible. I haven't seen many of them. I've seen a few. But they're driven by different things. They have different motives. See, if you ask yourself the question, when do you think you'll be successful? Or how do you consider yourself when you're successful? What would make you successful? Glenn, the fire starter, is going to start saying something like, I see myself out there, we're helping these people, 
we're doing the good thing and people are really starting to notice what we're doing. We're on the front page of this, you know. People are asking us to come talk about it and stuff like that. It's like, okay, sounds like a good thing. Arthur or Josephine is an entrepreneur. If you ask Josephine the same thing, when do you think you'll be successful? She's gonna say something slightly different. Josephine's gonna say, when I'm successful, that's when I can step back and just see how this thing moves on its own. See how people are giving life to it, this thing that we started building a long time ago, and how it's just like happening and becoming something, and when I'm not even needed anymore. You see the difference between those two motives? Only one of them is scalable. See, I'm gonna be a bit controversial. It's always good to kill a couple of, of, uh, a couple of common notions. I think fire starters and idealists are driven by ego. Actually, it's a scientific fact. Helping people makes us feel good. It does. That's a probably a good mechanism. It's a good functionality of kind of how to build civilization and so forth. It's a good, good trait that we have. Helping people is a good thing. I'm not gonna, gonna be down on that. But helping someone or feeling good because you're helping someone doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually able to help them, that you're actually doing good unless you're being very, very specific, you're measuring what you're doing, and you're allowing yourself to be held accountable to that. Ego is not scalable because people are not scalable. If you are the center of your model of operation or your business model, you're not gonna be able to scale. If you're the only person who can do it, if your level of quality is the only standard that's acceptable, you're not gonna be able to grow. Now, what makes entrepreneurs interesting and scalable is because they work with models, business models, organizational models. It's ways of doing things, it's ways of selling things, ways of making things, but that work with other people. Other people can take these models, these business models and operational models, and put them into reality. That makes it scalable, all right? So why didn't we invest in a lot of entrepreneurs? There must have been a bunch of entrepreneurs there were in the 400 that we screened. Well, there's one catch, and here's where it gets a little bit tricky with the social sector. See, if you want to sell someone something, someone has to buy it. It's an unfortunate circumstance. And uh, there's not a lot of people walking around paying for their own integration. There's not a lot of people walking around, or well some are, paying for their own mental health to disappear. Um, it's not so much a consumer market always. It's the trickery of trying to figure out who wants to pay for the people that I want to help and do they actually want to pay me for the good that I want to do. And that's a real challenge you have to face and figure out. So what do you need? You need a purpose that's measurable. You need a practice, a way of doing things that works. And you need a proposition that sells. And I'm gonna help you with that last one. See, so much entrepreneurship today and innovation is binary, you know, you, it's the Uber of something, it's the Airbnb of that, it's graphene for X, you know, these kind of things. And that's good, there's some great opportunities to be, to be developed there. But when it comes to social entrepreneurship and social innovation, you have to be uh, really, really aware of the context, the ecosystem you're working in. Just working with uh, underprivileged children or children with mental ill health is a really sensitive topic. If you want to be the Uber of, you know, um, uh, mentally sort of challenged young children, that could go wrong very, very quickly. If you don't understand the ecosystem you're working in, if you don't understand why you're being paid and how that works or kind of calculates in the system you're in, that could go wrong very, very quickly. So you have to be more than binary. You have to be kind of tertiary. You have to figure out how can you sell something that helps integration that even a person that doesn't even like the idea of integration would still buy because it's so good? So that's a challenge in business development. If you want to get into social innovation, that's a challenge. So you need to break up. Sorry, you, you, you don't need to break up. Sorry. <laughs> you don't need to break up. Uh, you need to break up with your ego. All of you need to break up with your ego. You also need to break up with your idea of business. Because we're saying that entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship is a good idea uh, if you want to be a social innovator. But entrepreneurs also chase the money. 
entrepreneurs build businesses. Businesses work because money's in them. Does that mean then that the entrepreneur is automatically going to do good? Maybe they even have a pretty good purpose. Not necessarily. What you need to make sure is that you get paid for what actually creates good. You need to be paid for doing good. Not just wanting to do good, but actually doing good. Being paid for the results. If those two are the same thing, doing good and getting paid, then you can scale not thinking about it because you're going to create good while you're scaling. If you earn money somewhere here and you use that money to do good over there, then what's going to happen when you start earning a lot of money is that people are going to start forgetting a little bit about this thing because that's getting a lot more fun to the people who are counting. So you have to be vigilant and vigilant on that purpose. A good thing about purpose though, and being honest to purpose and really knowing your target groups and so forth, is it ingrains itself into your organization and culture. It re like that's why you're gonna get great people working in your organization, because they want to work with your purpose. That's what works. So let's start hacking integration, okay? What's integration? That's unfortunate. Um, see, no one really wants to define integration. It's a hot potato. Uh, there are some migration research institutions around the world that kind of do a little bit of try at it. But basically, a lot of people talk about jobs and language. Is that good enough? I don't think so. I think we intuitively know that just having a job and Swedish, for example, is not going to make you integrated in Sweden. So think about Abdul. Abdul works in a pizzeria. He has an awesome pizzeria, okay? He makes the best capricciosa. He works in a small town in Sweden. Abdul uh, spends his days mostly around his Kurdish friends and family, his kind of social scene. He doesn't actually have a proper Swedish friend, only maybe Glenn, uh, who works at the post office now that he's put his uh, entrepreneurship to rest, uh, who likes Abdul's exotic you know, addresses on his letters and such. Is Abdul integrated? You might have a debate about that, right? We asked a lot of people working with integration, how do they define integration when they try to help people? And they told us, actually. It wasn't much harder than that. So we have an idea what integration might look like. And I'm going to give it to you. So think about the Maslow's there of needs. Okay, basic needs at the bottom. It's like a pyramid. And like self-actualization, really kind of, you know, com excelling at your life in the, in the top of it. Everybody needs roof overhead. That's basic. You need physical and mental health. That's actually really, really important. Because you're not going to get yourself integrated. You're not going to work in your job unless you have physical and mental health with you. So that's really important to secure. You need information about society and culture. People do not arrive at the bridge in Malmö knowing what a fika is. And actually, it's the first thing that people tell uh, when they start getting sick of the labor market organization or, or um, the labor market authority that these people don't know how to be in a Swedish workplace. And we are special. We're wonderful and we're special, but we're also a little bit odd and we need to help people meet us. But they need information on how to work in, in, in society. They also need language, talked about that, but language works best when it's combined with some sort of other training, labor or skills or something else. That's what works, okay? You also need a lot of language and that's where technology comes in because you need 4,800 Swedish teachers just to cater to the people that are here now and actually we don't have any more teachers. You know that, we, d we have a lack of teachers in Sweden. So you need technology to figure out how can you take an individual teacher and help them teach more people. These people also need access to communities, their own so that they can be comfortable and connecting with a community that they understand and get quicker into society, but they also need to connect to other communities, communities that they don't understand. That's going to help them connect to relationships and networks that's going to be able to, to uh, help them get jobs. And then eventually they need work. But it doesn't all start with work necessarily. Unless you have these other factors, being successful in a workplace in Sweden can be a really tricky thing. And here's an interesting thing. If you think about it, Roof over your head, physical, mental health, information about society, access to communities, not just your own, but also other people's communities, work, um, language and training. Swedes needs that just as well. You might think about language maybe isn't as important. Actually, I think it's more important. See, they know, might know Swedish, but something that our sector has learned in social innovation is that the people who are able to translate between government 
nonprofit and business are incredibly good at getting these different sectors to work together. And it is the key skill that the sector of social entrepreneurship and social innovation is cultivating. It also happens to be one of the skills that's listed as the most important for the future of the labor market. Because more organizations than ever before are starting to work businesses have to start thinking about politics. They have to start thinking about the relationships to government. They have to start thinking about their responsibilities and how they're affecting the communities that they are in and so on. Nonprofits have to start getting a little bit more business minded and understanding how they relate to politics. So that's a really great skill to build. So it even has a name. It's called multilingual leadership. Something you can look up and look into. So now you have most of it. You have the skills of the future. You know how to do integration. Good luck.